And good morning. My name is Seryu. Uh, I'm a senior student at the Village Zendo, coming uh, to this Zazenkai from San Diego over Zoom. It's really wonderful and for me healing uh, to be with you all this morning, to feel the continuity of our practice, even across the, the pixels and the, the Wi-Fi transmissions. <laughs> um, to feel with you in community and Sangha, even in silence. I'd like to offer a few words this morning, though, on maybe what feels like the opposite, on, on letting go and the freedom that can come from this letting go. Right now, especially on this Saturday after the 2024 U.S. presidential election. I know I'm finding it difficult to let go, and so I wanted to explore this a bit with you, um, just with three recent um, pretty non-dramatic examples from my life and see where this takes us. Uh, so the first example. I have been really so grateful uh, this year to be part of the Village Zendo's Path of Expression classes, uh, first with Gesho in the spring exploring poetry, and now with Fusho Sensei in the fall, uh, we've been practicing the art of ikebana, or flower arrangement. And um, it's just been this fantastic space for me, um, not only of play and creativity, which is kind of what I was expecting from it, but also for some really surprising moments of self-observation that I hadn't expected. So in our class, our last class in October, uh, we were working with upright arrangements. Uh, Fusho gave us some instructions and then set us off for 20 or 30 minutes to work on our arrangements. Um, I wasn't at home. Um, but instead at a writing residency in the Bay Area. Um, and so before the class began, uh, rather than buying flowers, I went out and foraged from my immediate surroundings. Uh, in this case, it was the foot of the Santa Cruz Mountains in this beautiful redwood and California laurel forest studded with, uh, with open fields of golden quaking grass, oak trees bristling with acorns, uh, and um, to my surprise, the fallen feathers from a troop of turkeys that would pass by my studio twice a day in the, in the early morning and in the, in the evening. <laughs> um, so uh, because I wasn't at home, I didn't have any vases to work with. Uh, instead, I ended up improvising and using my bright orange Yeti water bottle. Um, Having found uh, you know, so much material out on the grounds of the residency, uh, I went into the session, into this class with my one and only vase, knowing I'd wanna make multiple arrangements. So I decided I would practice letting go and simply make an arrangement. Then when it was done, kind of immediately undo it and make another, and then again, and again, as many times as, as, as I had time for uh, until Fusho called us back. So uh, I made the first one. First, the upright lavender chrysanthemum with its spidery petals. Then a pear tree sucker, silvery white with a bloom of, of fine pears all over its young leaves and stem. And then finally, stems of oregano flowers, low and cl clustered uh, at the base, and a turkey feather tossed in as an experiment. Each stem chosen and maneuvered into a place like a game of Tetris. It was such fun to create this way, uh, to arrange elements into place to mysteriously arrive at a, at a harmonious whole. 
you can probably guess what I felt next. Take it apart? Oh no. In the space of just three or four minutes, um, I had gotten attached to the particular configuration of what only an hour before had been some plant life I hadn't even known existed. I'd made something beautiful. How could it come apart so soon? I negotiated with myself. Okay, okay. You're going to stick to the plan, but you can at least take a picture to document this one. You can keep the image, if, if not reality. So I took it apart after, after taking a picture, uh, slowly, regretfully thinking, you know, well, at least if I don't like anything else I do, I have an image and, and I can recreate it. Later, after the class, I looked at the photo I'd taken and it was nothing like what I had experienced in the, mo in the moment of its making. It was disappointing, dead, static. What was missing? I made another arrangement, uh, this time with chrysanthemum, Spanish broom, California horse chestnut, and a single blade of wild oats that, you know, as I placed it, snapped in half and bent uh, in, in half at a right angle. Again, oh no, it ruined the whole composition that I had in mind. I stepped back to assess this minor Ikebana disaster, <laughs> only to find that actually the bent grass perfected what in the moment felt for me like, wow, now this, this is the platonic ideal of all Ikebana. This is the standard and the measure. For a moment, I let go. And, you know, allowing the broken grass to be could see the beauty of it. And then, of course, attachment returned. This arrangement surely had to be kept. This was it. I fussed with it. I smiled like a fool, <laughs> looking at it from various angles. And didn't make another arrangement before the time was over. Creation can be such a powerful activity, but it can also be a place of getting stuck. Who knows what my third, fourth, or fifth arrangements might have been like if I'd been able to let go of the second one. You know, thinking, thinking about zazen practice, I, I can remember... Uh, early in my practice, how I used to play games with myself when counting my breath. One. Two. Three. Blah, 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 blah. Chattering thoughts in lots of different directions. Oh, well, I know I was at three, so let's just go on to four. Four. Thinking, thinking, more thinking. Where was I? Five, I think. Okay, six. Have to get to 10, must reach 10. Where was I? Eight, eight, breathe. I remember being, I was so fixated on some idea that getting to 10 was a beautiful thing, an achievement of some sort, that I would game the practice rather than begin again with a new arrangement of breaths, starting over at one and simply seeing what that might be like. So a second example, um, if difficulty letting go of our creations is one problem, then letting go of our pre preconceptions so that we can create an, is another. Um, 
because I drove up to this writing, writer's residency in the Bay I was at, uh, I was able to bring some art making supplies with me to work on alongside my writing. So um, forgive me, uh, but since I'm giving this talk over Zoom, um, I think a little show and tell will help um, at this point. So I am a terrible, terrible homeowner who uh, hates the idea of a lawn at all and definitely hates mowing a lawn. So um, I brought some overgrown grass and you can see just how overgrown it was in my little front lawn. Um, and I, so that's for my front yard. And I brought um, some jasmine vines, dried jasmine vines from my backyard with me in the back of my car. Um, and, um, and I brought them up with me uh, to the residency to try to make something. You know, uh, if I can only see grass as grass and overgrown weedy grass at that, um, or these vines as just an ornamental plant that makes pretty fragrant flowers in the spring, then I shut out possibility. So right now, even <laughs> my cat is discovering that this wispy grass is actually a wonderful toy and a and a, a Pacific time early morning snack. Um, you know, if I can uh, let this grass and these vines be free of my preconceptions, then just by twisting them together. I can make something solid like this basket. And if I'm observant of the world around me at this writing residency, uh, then uh, I can let each thing I encounter actually be many things uh, like quaking grass heads and turkey feathers and the sepals of ripe persimmon, they can be many things. Of course, I say um, that this basket is solid, that I've turned wispy grass and delicate vines into something concrete. Um, by twisting grass and vines, though, has anything been gained? Well, it serves a function. Um, but didn't the grass and the vines when they were waving in the breeze in my yard serve a function? Uh, this basket will break down over time. Uh, the jasmine vines that bind it will weaken and snap. The grass is going to grow brittle and, and come apart into dust or maybe be eaten by my cats. <laughs> um, it'll eventually end up in a compost pile. But has anything been lost? Can it not become a refuge for ants and worms and fungus? And, you know, looking at my Zoom screen right now and thinking about the refuge of this Zazenkai space today, um, it too feels a lot like a basket. Um, woven of disparate parts uh, of, of folks in the New York Zendo, um, other people in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts or in upstate New York or in Costa Rica or in San Diego or Mexico City or wherever you may be. I see Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, the, the, the DC area, it's amazing that together we weave into something that feels so functional and carry with carrying capacity, like this Zazenkai, like Arzendo, like a Sangha. But this too will snap and break away and transform in a little bit 
we'll turn our Zoom screens off, we'll get our shoes on and our coats and walk out into the Tribeca streets. Has anything disappeared? The third example of letting go in my life these days um, just happened yesterday. Uh, for the past year or so, I've been working on a translation from Spanish of a Franco-Uruguayan playwright's uh, piece called Divina Invención o Una Celebración de Amor, uh, in English, Divine Invention or the Celebration of Love. Uh, when I first read it, I was really taken by it about two years ago, and I, I got in touch with the author and asked his permission to translate and publish it. And he graciously agreed. And so I proceeded to work away at it, uh, turning in the final proofs just before Summer Ongo this year to the publisher, um, this highly regarded micro press that lovingly sets the type by hand and, and letter presses by hand, um, a limited edition of 100 numbered copies. Um, so, uh, so my copies arrived in the mail earlier this week, um, and they are gorgeous material art objects, and hopefully also a, a fair translation of the original. Um, this is the first time I've worked on an extensive translation like this, and like flower arranging, I had so much fun wrapping my, my mind. Uh, around the idiomatic ambiguities of certain Spanish terms and finding the artful English word or phrase that would capture it. Um, I had, so to speak, made a beautiful arrangement of words and was proud of it. Yesterday, Friday, uh, in a casual internet search, I came across the web page of Another English translation of this very same text published by a major press in August. The writer never mentioned that there would be another translation. Um, and in a certain light, the fact of this prior publication from a major press makes mine from a tiny venue irrelevant, even worthless. At least um, that's how I've been feeling in the past 24 hours, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. This work arrived in the mail on Monday and I held it in my hands and I was its translator. On Friday, was I still its translator anymore? Who was I? So why am I talking about baskets and flower arrangements and um, some publishing hijinks? Um, because in this moment, it feels like our country is an arrangement being dismantled, like a basket of woven differences fraying and coming apart, like an identity crisis. How can we practice in this moment? While weaving the basket over the course of October uh, and knowing I'd be giving a talk at the beginning of November, my mind kept going to the koan, Keichu makes carts from the Moomin Khan, it's case number eight. Um, and now in the wake of, of the Tuesday election, uh, it feels more appropriate than ever and has really taken on a, a kind of a different resonance for me. Um, here's the koan. Master Gaetan said to a monk, Keichu made a cart whose wheels had a hundred spokes. Take both the front and rear parts away and remove the axle. Then what will it be? Master Gaetan said to a monk, Keichu made a cart whose wheels had a hundred spokes. Take both the front and rear parts away and remove the axle, then what will it be? Since Wednesday, 
since I woke up to the news of the election results, uh, this image has been haunting me. The U.S. feels like the wheels have fallen off and the axle broken. What now? Take both the front and rear parts away and remove the axle. Then what will it be? Then what will the U.S. be? When I was making my flower arrangements, it only took me a few minutes to become attached to what I had created. How much more so for many of us, the beautiful arrangements of our society that, that have been made through so much hard work and struggle, to name just a few, legal recognition and medical care for trans and gender non-conforming people, an arrangement arguably still in process and incomplete. National legal same-sex marriage, an arrangement almost 10 years old. The protection of dreamers, 13 years old. Women's bodily autonomy, 51 years old. Democracy itself, almost 250 years old. Many of us, um, I think, fear, and, and with good reason, that these arrangements are soon to be dismantled. I've heard Enkya Roshi in the past speak about the etymology of the term dukkha, normally translated into English as suffering. The ka is an axle hole in a wheel, just as in Keichu's cart, and du is difficult or bad. Thus, suffering is like a badly fitting axle that doesn't fit into the center of the wheel correctly, and so the wheel clunks along, upsetting the whole cart it carries. How is this suffering? One half of the country right now is arguing that the other half has chiseled the wheels badly and ruined the ride for everyone. On the one hand, rent and food are too expensive. Perceived others, whether immigrants or trans people, threaten society. The future is uncertain. Or, on the other hand, truth is being ignored and lies spread. Violence is being uplifted as a viable option. Racism, xenophobia, transphobia, homophobia, and misogyny are being normalized. The future is uncertain. I freely uh, admit to being part of one particular half of that dukkha blame game. But in both cases, each side is disappointed with the gap in the hole between axle and wheel, between their ideals and reality. And thunk, 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 they're jolted by each turn as the cart bumps along. I'd humbly offer that our practice suggests a different approach, though. In the Lotus Sutra, there is a parable about a father whose children are trapped in a burning building. They're so trapped that they don't even realize they're trapped at all. They're too busy playing with their toys inside as the walls and the floor and the roof burn in the blaze ready to collapse at any moment. Our house right now does feel as if it's on fire, though rather than playing, it feels as if we children are fighting each other, pulling, pulling at each other's hair and wrestling each other to the ground. The father outside, desperate to get his kids outside to safety, uh, devises a plan. For each of them, he builds a different kind of cart, each pulled by a different kind of animal, as a kind of toy that will coax them outside. What kind of cart would call to you? Maybe a national abortion rights law. For someone else, maybe a national abortion ban. 
Keichu was said to be the first person in mythological times to build a horse-drawn wheeled cart in China. In a way, you could say he invented the cart and the wheel and the axle. His wheels are magnificent, a hundred spokes radiating in all directions. And yet, in the koan, even his cart is disintegrating before our eyes. Is the car ever going to be perfect? Is our practice about shaving the interior of the wheel hub or the surface of the axle end into perfect alignment? First with a, a chisel and then with maybe a pen knife and finally with a, with a laser to get things perfectly smooth? If I can only count to 10, if I can only do this liturgy position right, if I can only maintain my concentration through a whole period, if I can only not get angry, if I can only be peaceful, if I can only, if I can only. But what is the point of the carts the father makes for his children? The carts are not the prize. A smooth ride is not the prize. The point is to leave the burning building. The point is to stop burning. And, you know, maybe that can sound like quietism on its surface, a kind of a, a quenching of difficult emotions, a repression, or an extinguishing, so to speak, of the fires. But actually, it begins with being the burning through and through, waking up to the fact that you are burning in the first place. Who cares if you ever make it to 10? The wheel will still thunk, thunk, thunk. Can you feel it? What is Keichu's cart? the Master Gaetan, that Master Gaetan is asking us about. What is it that is carrying you, even as its front and rear parts and axle disappear? Right now, the national cart broken down on the side of the road without axles or wheels, just a wooden box. What is it? If I can let go, Maybe like the grass is in my front yard, I can see it for something other than broken. Yes, maybe it's a coffin. But maybe that same box is a garden bed filled with soil and manure. Lord knows we've got enough shit to throw in there to grow food for self-sufficiency and community care. Or maybe if it's turned upside down, it can be a podium for getting up onto and becoming an activist, working to organize with others. Or maybe even on its side, it will have to be a barricade. Who can say? If I require it to ever and always be a cart and a perfect one at that, then I'm locked down even trapped in a burning building. If I can let go of what I need it to be, maybe it burns through and through and I can make it useful in some new way. Muman's poem for this koan reads, when the vividly working wheel turns, even an expert is lost. Four directions above and below, south, north, east, and west. I'll read that again. When the vividly working wheel turns, even an expert is lost. Four directions, above and below, south, north, east, and west. Experts right now are busy examining the broken wheels of the cart. They're doing forensic examinations on the busted axle trying to figure out what went wrong. Diagnoses will be offered, solutions proposed. But regardless, a vividly working wheel is turning. 
Can you feel it? Can you be it? When I was Shuso over the summer, after the beautiful arrangement of Ongo was made and then dismantled, I was given a congratulatory card with this great, crudely drawn, smiling face and the words, smile and don't expect so much. I love this uh, expression, smile and don't expect so much. Uh, part uh, and keep it uh, tucked into my bedroom mirror uh, to remind me that when I'm making flower arrangements and trying to angle my computer camera so the rest of the Zoom class can see, I smile. When I see daffodil leaves and realize, oh, that would make a great binder for a basket, I smile. When I translate a Spanish phrase into just the right English one, I smile. When I check in with my trans friend to see how she's doing, can I smile? When I cross paths with my neighbor with AstroTurf in his front yard and Fox News blasting in his backyard, can I smile? Can I let go and just smile without expecting so much? And then even after, whether I slide easily into the next moment or I attach and burn, maybe smolder, maybe explode, can I come back to myself, to just what is, to this miraculous cart with no rear or front, no wheels, no axle, and smile? When I can, then perhaps, I can even be a bodhisattva, a cart myself in the great burning house, able to offer the ride to anyone and everyone. Hop on, let's go for a ride. Thunk, thunk, thunk.